Welcome everyone to the afternoon session of the second day of our summer school, which starts with an outstanding keynote speaker. We have Christoph Bock here. Um, Christoph is a, is a star in the field of, of bioinformatics and, and machine learning. He's um, currently full professor for biomedical informatics at the Medical University of Vienna and uh, also at the research center uh, of the Austrian Acad Academy of Sciences for, uh, mo for molecular medicine. Um, yeah, as I said, he has done outstanding work. He, his, he has won the Otto Hahn Medal for his PhD studies at the Max Planck Institute in, in Saarbrücken. Then he was a postdoc at the Broad Institute. And then he became a principal investigator at the Center for Molecular Medicine in Vienna. He won the Overton uh, Prize for uh, early career accomplishments in computational biology and two ERC starting grants, um, just to, to name a few of the honors that, that uh, Christoph has received to, uh, throughout his career. Um, he's also a fellow of, of ELIS, this European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems. He, he's the expert, one of the star experts for epigenetics and how to analyze it with single cell technology. We are very happy to have you here, Christoph, and excited to learn about your work and, and the, the future plans and your vision for the future. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, summer schools are a particular pleasure. I have spent kind of doing my PhD the first two years. I think each summer I was at a summer school that has very much shaped what I'm doing. And I, I learned a lot of the things uh, like how to approach a problem from these type of, of, of summer schools. Obviously we're missing out on the in-person character this year, hopefully uh, next year, um, that's also part of the game and um, summer's over at least in Vienna. So um, perhaps we're not missing out on, on the outdoor part too much, but certainly the discussions. And I'm very happy that uh, you've been organizing it such that there we, we will have a chat with the students after the presentation. So as uh, Carsten has already alluded to, uh, I'm a computational uh, scientist by training and with a focus on machine learning for the longest time. But I realized early on that uh, machine learning is strongest when it's combined with really relevant data and also with the ability to validate your, your, your predictions and your findings. So um, the lab I'm leading here in, in Vienna, it combines um, computational methods development, applications of computational technology, as well as wet lab and kind of high throughput uh, biology to kind of in a combination in order to dissect uh, the role of cell state. I add here kind of an epigenetic because I think the epigenome is really what gives us a perspective into the developmental past and future potential of cells. So today I will really focus on kind of use, describe how we use all these technologies to um, approach a biological problem with, with real medical relevance. And I will take the epigenetic perspective to it. Um, the epigenome being kind of this intermediate level uh, or layer of control um, on top of the genomic DNA sequence that um, switches on and off or keeps uh, genes in a, in a closed or open state. But I like to think, uh, and sometimes the epigenome has been referred to kind of a second code of the, of, of the genome. Um, I find that too redu reductionistic and I would rather like to think about it, especially in the context of today's talk as the state space, the potential landscape in which cells live and develop and die. Um, this was first kind of very intuitively visualized by uh, Conrad Waddington already in the 1950s uh, as a model of development with the idea that a, um, a stem cell, essentially the, the fertilized egg would start in a, um, state of um, pluripotency, a state of being able to develop into pretty much anything. And then as it differentiates along these different trajectories, um, it would actually become um, ever more restricted to certain patterns. 
um, such that you could think of kind of the first trajectories here between the um, kind of hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic lineages, and then the myeloid lineage, the lymphoid lineage, or further breaking up into B cells, T cells, etc. Um, now, this is the, the power of this, uh, this paradigm is that it provides uh, kind of, an, it, it no longer sees cells as a snapshot in, at, a, at a single point in time. And sometimes when we look at RNA-seq data, we are simplifying essentially um, kind of seeing uh, cells as backs of RNA molecules as, as was recently suggested, which is useful in some cases, but uh, it, and there's really kind of a, a history and a future to each cell. And that oftentimes can, can be captured very nicely with the epigenome. And I will show a few examples of, of this epigenetic memory concept. We can also capture what happens in diseases. For example, in cancer, a common situation is this block of differentiation that a leukemic cell just doesn't reach term terminal differentiation anymore or it goes to totally off the chart and starts behaving in unexpected and, and disease-associated patterns. Importantly for me, the epigenome is not something that should be kind of pitched against gene regulation. Like if you don't like the term epigenome, you can think of this as a chromatase team-based, uh, memory-based form of gene regulation that we're talking about. But to me, the best way of Seeing is, is, uh, um, is, is the epigenome and transcription regulation as essentially two sides of the same coin. So if you look on top of the epigenetic landscape, you see this kind of developmental trajectories. And here already in the original study or in the original um, book that proposed these ideas uh, was a drawing of what is kind of underneath this epigenetic landscape. Essentially regulators, you can think of transcription factors, keeping this landscape in shape. And then you can already very visually um, get an idea of what will happen if a transcription factor here is mutated in cancer. These ropes, essentially regulatory mechanisms disappear, the landscape changes, and perhaps uh, a cancer cell gets stuck here and keeps proliferating, but never reads terminal differentiation. Now today we are in a computational meeting. So myself being a computational person, it's, it's hard to look at these things without wanting to overcome the metaphorical character and actually make it something that we can calculate, infer, and, uh, and essentially perform uh, mathematical operations on top of this. And this has been proposed. So the idea is that this epigenetic landscape is indeed a some form of quasi-potential landscape uh, in which of, um, we can see cells develop and perhaps eventually do real predictive science on this in the sense that um, when a cell differentiates towards a certain trajectory and is being hit here by a, an oncogene, uh, to predict whether what kind of cell states these uh, cells enter into. Now, this was kind of more of a pipe dream for, for many years, including uh, 2011, when this kind of attempts were an attempt was made by Sui Huang to formalize this concept. But with the recent boost of single cell technologies, in particular single cell multiomics profiling, this is really getting in reach uh, into reach. And I think um, this is a really exciting area. And today, I will present some kind of initial um, evidence or initial uh, applications where we, we've combined computational methods with experimental work to try and exploit this, uh, this concept. But it's certainly just becoming feasible as we speak and much more work uh, needs to be done to really be able to compute on the cell state landscape and, or epigenetic cell state landscape. So in the first part, uh, I will talk about single cell analysis of epigenetic cell states. We started working on this as, as part of the International Human Epigenome Consortium and focusing on the hematopoietic lineage, essentially on the human blood. The idea here is that the hematopoietic lineage, the human blood is, is a relatively well understood system. So we kind of knew what we expected we, what we were expecting, which is a, kind of makes it useful for, for technology computational technology development. Uh, 
Plus at that time, we had in the context of the Blueprint project, we had developed a method, single cell whole genome bisulfide sequencing that allowed us to get um, DNA methylation profiles from um, low input samples, but also from single cells. So essentially what we did together with colleagues in Cambridge, we uh, sorted um, um, various uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells from the blood of, of healthy individuals. We performed DNA methylation. And when, then we used a, a, a prediction framework um, to essentially classify each of these uh, cells uh, or samples into their cell identity with the hematopoietic stem cells, the progenitor cells, uh, the myeloid lineage and the lymphoid lineage. And essentially from the misclassification rates, we constructed a network that <clears throat> su looked surprisingly similar to what we were expecting from prior knowledge here. So this was a proof of concept that uh, machine learning methods uh, trained pure, kind of purely trained on um, epigenetic data, in this case, DNA methylation, can provide insights into developmental trajectories, essentially into the memory of cells as they, they, they develop. Now, obviously, in that first study, we just validated what we already knew from, from prior research. So we were then really excited to take this, those uh, methods to uh, applications where we had no clue what might be happening. And one of the really kind of, kind of most unresolved uh, uh, applications in biology are rare genetic diseases, where we often know the mutation, but um, a whole kind of new, essentially you're having human knockouts, genetic diseases where individual genes are knocked out. And then we see kind of a comprehensiveness of biological phenotypes that is often much more than we were expecting. And one such case here was Langerhansen histiocytosis, particularly interesting because it is clearly driven by a cancer associated mutation, BRAF V600E, that's a very well established cancer driver mutation. At the same time, um, you see here these lesions. These lesions are for the most part just accumulating myeloid immune cells. They never get into this trajectory of metastasis and clonal evolution, et cetera. So in many ways, this is also an autoimmune disease. Um, so it is not quite a cancer, not quite an autoimmune immune disease. So really, we really wanted to take a look at these lesions and see what's happening here. Um, to that end, we did single cell RNA-seq and, and attack-seq on uh, sorted cell populations and essentially using the concept of entropy, the idea that um, stem cells tend to have kind of more broadly uh, expressed genes and kind of all more open chromatin. And then essentially as the balls roll, roll down this Waddington landscape that I showed earlier, the cells become ever more restricted in, in their identity. So we applied these type of methods to our data set and we've indeed found a structure here. We could infer, infer that there are two, two types of progenitor cells and then a bifurcation of maturing and kind of more destructive disease associated uh, cells that seem to be driving this, this rare childhood disease. Now in both cases, we are essentially capturing developmental trajectories. So in a, in a way, during the developmental history, what I call the past or developmental past of cells. Now we can also try to use the epigenome to look into the future of cells. And for that kind of the model that I'm picking for today's talk is really on uh, immune regulation. Immune regulation is, is particularly useful for thinking about the epigenome because um, cells need to pre be prepared. Cells are confronted with a lot of things uh, relatively suddenly, in particular um, infections, and they need to cope. Um, and our hypothesis here was that um, non-immune cells, essentially the structural cells of the body, fibroblast, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, those cells that line our organs, that line our blood vessels, and that kind of as fibroblasts kind of keep our tissue together, that those cells are really kind of an, um, 
underappreciated first line of, of, of defense and alarm for the immune system. So we sorted all of these cell, uh, these cell types from 12 different organs of the mouse and we performed um, transcriptome and epigenome sequencing on those samples. And we found indeed that there is more um, kind of activity in, uh, of immune genes than you would normally expect from an immune, a non-immune cell. But it was particularly interesting when we started correlating what we are seeing on the epigenetic level, the chromatin accessibility with what we are seeing on the gene expression level. So we found that oftentimes in these structural cells, immune genes were carrying a highly open promoter, but were only moderately expressed. So normally there is kind of a good global correlation between uh, promoter chromatin accessibility, essentially how open, how active a promoter is and how highly the, 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 the gene is uh, transcribed. Whereas in this case, uh, the cells tend apparently afforded kind of invested energy into keeping the chromatin of these um, immune gene promoters open, although they were not heavily uh, expressed. So essentially our interpretation here kind of from a kind of systems biological or systems immunological perspective was that these cells keep um, important immune genes in an unrealized potential. So essentially, although these are terminally differentiated cells um, in the epigenetic landscape, they seem to be keeping a certain level of altitude and essentially to have the potential to very quickly respond in one or the other way as, um, for example, an infection might, might come about. So our model really that needs validation, of course, is that structural cells use the epigenome to program themselves for future challenges. Now to, to test this, this, uh, this, this model, we infected the mice with a, a virus that um, attacks essentially all organs of the, of the mouse. And then we looked at which genes were upregulated or downregulated. And here in a, in a type of enrichment curve that's, that's kind of similar to a rock curve in, in, in many ways, we saw that there was a, indeed um, high specific sensitivity and specificity of these genes to be up that we found um, kind of epigenetically prepared for a quick reaction to indeed go up in response to an infection. So the model that emerges from this is that the structural cells um, keep an epigenetic state that allows them to rapidly respond to uh, all kinds of future challenges, such as um, viral infection, which we tested here, but likely also wound healing, physical insults, sterile inflammation, metabolic challenges, et cetera. So kind of to sum up this part, we use the epigenome to reconstruct and model uh, what cells have gone through in their developmental history. And at the same time, we can use the epigenome uh, or cells are using the epigenome to program themselves for those things they need to be prepared for in the future. Now, if this is... Uh, Quite, quite a fundamental thing that cells are doing, then it should uh, likely be useful for both diagnostics and therapies. And um, kind of in the next part of the presentation, I would like to connect some of these topics that we've discussed so far with um, kind of relevance in precision medicine. So here, epigenetic biomarkers have been an an interesting concept for quite a while already, in particular because they fill a very useful gap between the stability of DNA genome-based biomarkers and the fluctuating na nature of RNA-based biomarkers. So DNA methylation seems to be set primarily during early development when tissue identity is first formed and then keeps a, a long-term memory of that. Um, Today, um, DNA methylation is, is one of the best markers of tissue, tissue type. For example, it's even used in forensic applications. If you find DNA at a crime scene and the police wants to know whether this is um, blood from a fight or it is just kind of uh, hair or skin 
um, tissue from someone who walked by, uh, the DNA sequence cannot tell uh, us this information, but the, the DNA methylation profile that can be read from, from any DNA sample, that gives this information quite precisely. Also, uh, DNA methylation has emerged as, as, as perhaps the best uh, marker, biomarker of chronological age that we have at the moment. So based on the DNA methylation profile in the blood, you can predict with relatively high accuracy, plus minus a few years, uh, how old a, a person is. And indeed, deviations between the biological age of a person uh, based on the DNA methylation and the actual age uh, appear to be predict or have been shown to be predictive of for um, disease and death. So someone who is epigenetically younger than their chronological age will live longer to the degree that this has been licensed by an American insurance agency, life insurance agency, and is actually being used on for essentially adjusting premiums, uh, insurance premiums. There you can also see that these topics raises all kinds of ethical questions and, and topics that uh, we are happy to discuss uh, kind of in, in a follow-up. But let's stay on, stay on the scientific uh, side for the time being. And how we got into this uh, question of epigenetic biomarkers was through a collaboration with Manuel Estella, who challenged us to find a computational method that could uh, identify cell of origin in can metastatic cancers. So there are about 10% of all metastatic cancers or newly diagnosed metastatic cancers, which are called cancers of unknown primary sites. So in these cancers, you know, the patient presents with, for example, a liver metastasis, but it's not clear whether this was originally breast cancer or colon cancer or something completely different. So, and these are then very difficult to treat because you don't know which protocol you, you need to follow. So essentially the hypothesis was here, here was that these metastases that can be surgically removed from the liver, that this might keep an epigenetic memory of the cell of origin uh, from which this tumor was originally derived. Um, so we collected a large data set, we uh, trained and evaluated elastic net classifiers, and we were indeed able to assign these, um, uh, these tumors based on their DNA methylation profiles to the cell types or organs they were originally derived from. And this was then taken forward by collaborators into a large scale retrospective and a smaller scale prospective validation study where uh, it was shown that you can, this really, really works well. And in those cases where you can then assign a specific molecular targeted therapy in kind of with the knowledge that this is, for example, metastatic breast cancer, um, there was even an improvement in overall survival seen, although this is really prelim preliminary data that would uh, require further validation in a randomized controlled clinical trial. So with this idea that um, the cancer cells keep an epigenetic memory of the cells from which they were originally derived, we teamed up with colleagues uh, at the Children's Cancer Research Institute in Vienna, the team of Eleni Tomaso, and we wanted to find out in a, in, a, in a cancer Ewing sarcoma for which very little was really known about how this cancer um, develops and where it takes its heterogeneity from. We wanted to, you, um, to use DNA methylation essentially as a, as a window back into time of, of where this uh, cancer originally developed. The interesting thing here is we did not see what is often seen and what, what colleagues in Heidelberg, for example, have seen and demonstrated very nicely in, in brain tumors. We did not see kind of many nice clusters that were separated, but we see what we saw based on the DNA methylation landscape was a spectrum, a trajectory. Um, so kind of no clear binary separation, but but a, a quantitative spectrum. So what seems to be happening here and is conserved in the DNA methylation profiles is that a stem cell uh, develops into a mesenchymal cell. And during this phase, that is a gradual process, 
it is susceptible to transformation by the EWS fly one fusion uh, protein that is really driving this, this disease. So what seems to be happening here is that the um, transformation into cancer cell freezes a cell in its epigenetic state of where it was in the developmental phase when it first became a tumor. So in a way, uh, with the right type of inference uh, methods, we can use uh, tumors as kind of evolutionary windows into our kind of developmental past as, as, as humans. And we can also take this further into uh, cell-based bio, kind of, um, biomarkers based on liquid biopsy, based on blood. So in a follow-up study, we essentially exploited this unique uh, patterns as seen in, in these tumors to reconstruct or to follow the disease life as it unfolds in, in these, these patients. The concept here is when we know it's very well established from the field of liquid biopsy that tumor cells break apart and give DNA into the bloodstream. And what has been realized relatively recently is that these DNA fragments in the bloodstreams from broken cancer cells, that they are very much driven in their size distribution based on the chromatin structure, essentially the epigenome of the cells they were derived on. And we can use this with a dedicated software that is called Licorice to using machine learning method, methodology infer um, the cell of origin of these, these tumors, such so that we can over time follow not only which part of the body the tumor has been derived from, but also um, kind of how it develops over time, how it responds to chemotherapy, what other side effects of the chemotherapy has, for example, um, harming liver cells, um, essentially providing us, which is particularly important in children, because you don't not you cannot really biopsy the, the, these, these children very frequently because it's such an invasive assay, whereas based on the blood sample, we can really follow how the therapy develops over time. So we are always committed to making our software available. Uh, so many times it's really the application of the collaboration with clinici clinicians that drives our research. And then an, an interesting ideas emerge of what could be useful tools. And some of these tools uh, we then make available for, for the community uh, as kind of production quality software tools. I think you will find, if you're working with DNA methylation data, you will find RNBeats most useful. The LOLA tool is the most interesting if you have any set of region, genomic region data and you want to do a biological interpretation. So essentially you can think of LOLA as a form of um, gene set enrichment analysis, but for genomic regions. So other tools such as GREAT uh, use uh, essentially map genomic regions to genes and then do gene, uh, gene set enrichment analysis on genes. But we found it often at least complementary, sometimes more useful to uh, do a gene set or like a genomic region set enrichment analysis. And for that, we've developed the LOLA software and curated a data set that can be used as a reference uh, method, a reference uh, data set. Now, I said that we are going to do some precision medicine here. So um, that is, is, is a challenge because uh, it's, it's really important for, for precision medicine, not only to have a single point in time, but really follow the disease as it unfolds. And, the Ewing sarcoma that I presented with a focus on liquid biopsies already provides the first approach how this could work. The other very useful, or I would, I'm almost tempted to say model disease is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. That is not a huge unmet medical need because some people, most people live actually pretty well with it and there are good drugs, including um, uh, ibrutinib, which inhibits B cell receptor signaling that really allow us to handle this disease quite well. But it allows us to ask fundamental questions about this role of epigenetic cell states connecting the developmental past of cells with the future potential um, of, of the tumor to respond to, to chemotherapy and to um, all kinds of cancer treatments. <clears throat> 
And this is really the angle that we've been following here. We wanted to understand what happens when um, patients with this type of leukemia are going on a targeted therapy where we are essentially using a drug, taking out the driver uh, pathway uh, of, of the disease. So thanks to a collaboration with clinicians in Hungary, uh, we had a very nice data set, very few patients, seven patients, but sampled systematically uh, day after treatment, three days, seven days, 14 days, et cetera. So in a very systematic time series analysis, we did single cell RNA-seq and epigenome profiling. And then we used Gaussian processes to really try and sort out this time series character of this data set. And kind of an interesting thing that emerged here is that although all patients followed a, a different trajectory or like um, proceeded uh, um, in a different speed, all of them followed the same trajectory. So we saw a consistent biological program that unfolded in different speeds uh, in, in, in these um, different patients. And essentially the, the Gaussian processes here provided also a form of alignment between the, um, the, 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 the time series trajectories of these in the individual patients and a way of calibrating how far individuals had already um, um, advanced. From a biological side, what we see is that NF-kappa B binding was rapidly shutting down as a result of the B, uh, inhibition of the BTK kinase. And then the lineage defining transcription factors went down. So essentially um, those kind of, I showed this virus early that keep the epigenetic landscape in place. They were essentially cut through this signaling defect that we are pharmacologically inducing here. And then these cells eroded their um, leukemic uh, cell identity. So in this epigenetic landscape I presented earlier, essentially they're going off the chart and they are no longer in the kind of normal realm. And they seem to be still kind of uh, able enough to sense that something is wrong and then they go into a quiescence uh, stage. So these leukemic cells that we essentially blow out of their epigenetic landscape into kind of a no man's land of, of cell identity, these then go into a quiescent state. They do not go into apoptosis, but they go into a quiescent state and kind of hang around the bloodstream for, for quite a while longer. This also means that uh, while the drug is very powerful, the drug is not a cure. The, um, the, the moment we remove the drug, these quiescent cells rapidly reactivate and um, essentially lead to a full-blown relapse of the disease. And that's a problem because some people just don't, cannot tolerate this drug forever. And some, and some other people, the, these patient, the, the leukemic cells become resistant and, uh, resistant and eventually overcome the therapy. So what we did kind of on top of this initial study, we combined this with a, a pharmacological screening technology that was developed in the laboratory of Julius Petty Forga at our institute. And we, we essentially looked before and after the start of this targeted therapy. And we looked at the epigenetic landscape as well as on the drug sensitivity using a high throughput imaging workflow. And then we got kind of initial candidates that, um, we, that might synergize with the, um, the initial drug given to the patient. So essentially what we are looking for here, we want to exploit induced weaknesses in these uh, cells that go into um, quiescence and into kind of a broken epigenetic state to perhaps with a second drug wipe them out entirely such that it becomes safe to stop the treatment. Now this is early days and before you can bring those things into a kind of a clinical study, obviously much more work needs to be done, but it kind of motivated me to, to go back to a concept we've formulated uh, almost 10 years ago, inspired by work in HIV uh, in the laboratory of Thomas Langauer, uh, where I was a PhD student. Um, Essentially, the idea that uh, cancer therapy in the elderly is not necessarily about wiping out the cancer, but it is about um, 
modulating the evolutionary landscape of the cancer in such a way that uh, the disease can be kept chronic for long enough that an elderly person dies from some other disease. At the age of 80, we are not necessarily needing to achieve a cure anymore. If we can live, have patients have a good life for 20 or more years with the disease, managing the disease, that might be kind of as good or even better than a cure achieved at the cost of uh, the very high toxicity of, of a classical chemotherapy. So essentially inspired by, by work on, on HIV and targeted therapy, uh, they are adapted, drug combinations adapted based on computational methods and machine learning. We are thinking of uh, leukemia also as some uh, fitness landscape of, of, of the disease in which we essentially play chess with the cancer cells. So we put forward a move but we try to already calculate how the tumor might respond, how the tumor will eventually go get resistant. And rather than keeping the therapies at the front line until the tumor has evolved far enough to be fully resistant, we want to kind of rapidly adjust the therapeutic regimens based on kind of continuous monitoring and a computational prediction, like scenario prediction of what might happen if we are, um, changing um, therapy at a, at a relatively early stage. Now, obviously that's much more complex to achieve in cancer than it is in HIV because the human genome is so much bigger than and has higher complexity than in, it has in HIV. But this is clearly something that provides a perspective how computational methods can make a contribution to kind of increasingly making cancer chronic rather than an acute disease. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to go a bit beyond uh, kind of the more descriptive parts in the first two uh, um, parts of, the, uh, of, of, of today's presentations. So while um, single cell analysis really gives us the resolution to inspect um, epigenetic development, uh, looking into the past and future of cells, we ultimately want to not just model, but, but predict and validate and causally validate through mechanistic interventions. And that's really a challenge for people like me with a computational background and a interest in systems biological uh, approaches because doing mechanistic validation experiments often means that you pick a single gene, you make the mouse and you essentially have a postdoc working like five years on that particular knockout mouse to find out precisely what's happening here. Now, this is great, but it's a huge responsibility for, for the supervisor or, or to, to say, okay, wouldn't it be a good idea to work on that particular gene? Because you're essentially betting a postdoc's career on making the right pick here. Um, as the same, so, and as a result, if you're kind of a responsible uh, supervisor, you would probably pick something that had, has at least a 10% success chance chance of success or perhaps better a 50% or 80% chance of success. So perhaps uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of biology, uh, biological research is always happening on the same set of genes that are not only clearly P53 and many uh, of the very well researched genes, they are very important genes, no doubt about that. But there's also a certain kind of risk adversity of kind of trying to figure out new mechanisms around what we already know well. Um, so essentially what I, I think could be very exciting to find ways that would allow us to do mechanistic biology at a scale of at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of genes at the same time. So that we, we would not necessarily need to be genome wide. We can do some uh, prioritizations, but we certainly don't want to kind of narrow it down to kind of the single gene uh, type of research to early. I think here a combination of computational methods, high throughput perturbations and organic technology can really help us achieve this question of causality at scale. As a first step in this direction, it's, it's, you need to somehow kind of reduce 
uh, 22,000 human genes to like the 500 or 200 genes that you can realistically work on with the type of methods I will explain later. And here we found it very useful to use kind of the power of deep learning combined with the interpretability of regulatory, gene regulatory networks. This is based on work and of Nicolas Fratelli in my lab, who is now an assistant professor in Salzburg. And he has, he essentially kind of put forward this hypothesis that a gene regulatory network and an artificial neural network, they share this kind of depth of the, uh, the network, the multi-layer character. And perhaps we could force a um, deep learning algorithm to be trained on a gene regulatory network such that each uh, not in the gene regulatory network and each edge in this gene regulatory network has a biological interpretation as a, as a, a regulator or as a kind of regulatory mechanism. So essentially he found a way to um, translate these um, gene regulatory uh, networks into directed acyclic graphs that Care, keep much of the biological interpretability of the initial gene regulatory map network and to train them effectively with classical algorithms of deep learning uh, kind of network fitting um, in such a way that we really exploit the ability of deep learning algorithms to assign meaningful weights to intermediate knots in a, in a relatively many layer architecture. And we've been using this successfully to prioritize uh, transcription factors based on single cell sequencing data in terms of their regulatory potential. And then essentially this based on kind of massive case single cell sequencing data and this type of interpretable machine learning gives us an idea of which factors might be playing a role including not only transcription factors, but also signaling proteins that are difficult to incorporate with existing methodology because they are many layers away from the genes that they actually regulate. And then we can take those forward with into CRISPR single cell sequencing screens, um, such as the CropSeq technology that we've developed, where we are essentially performing um, genome editing at scale in, in in, in cells and then uh, perform a droplet-based sequencing of the um, guide RNAs that induces the perturbations and the transcriptional response to that perturbation. So with this, we can measure the effect of a thousand uh, knockouts, uh, knockouts of a thousand different genes in, on the gene regulatory landscape of these cells. This has been very successful. There's been other technologies developed that uh, serve very similar purposes, such as PerturbSeq, CRISPR-Seq, MosaicSeq, and it's really the combination of these technologies, as well as the growing scale of single cell sequencing that allows us to do kind of perturbation biology at scale and go beyond this purely descriptive inferential perspective and get actual hard data what happens when you take out a, mean, a main a kind of a key regulator. And this can be done in cell lines, obviously. It can also be done in primary tissue, but uh, I, I see a lot of value in doing this in organoids because organoids give you the perturbability, perturbability of, of primary tissue with the of same flexibility and access to materials that you would normally expect from, from cell lines. So along those lines, we've, we've proposed, and I'm, uh, I'm leading a pilot project within the human cell atlas where we do large scale single cell sequencing of human organoids and working with uh, Oliver Stegler at the DKFZ on these, these topics, we are trying to establish kind of a Rosetta Stone approach where people working in in on organoids can map what they are seeing to the um, to the human primary situation as well as what you're seeing the human primary uh, situation you can map back to organoids but you can perturb and this going back and forth between in vitro and in vivo using high throughput uh, perturbation methods such as crop seek as well as 
um, interpretable deep learning. I think this has a lot of power in terms of making mechanistic biology high throughput. Now I'm almost at the end of my presentation. The last few slides are is essentially, it's a bit of a sideline. It's, uh, it's motivated by what I described earlier. We need to be able to really, really scale our methods in terms of single cell sequencing. And what has been the big bottleneck for CropSeq and for CropSeq and similar approaches has been the high cost of single cell sequencing. So along those lines, we've uh, kind of looked very carefully at these microfluidics devices and uh, we're disappointed to see um, how much very expensive reagents really goes to the bin because you are stochastically loading these droplet devices to avoid duplicates. And we tried to figure out a way how we can get the maximum of what we pay for out of these devices. So essentially what we are doing is we are um, heavily overloading these droplet generators, not like factor two, but like factor 10 or factor 100, such that in each droplet, um, many, many individual cells end up. And how we then disentangle the whole thing is because we do a plate-based pre-indexing strategy uh, as in combinatorial indexing approaches, such that we can then afterwards really tell the part what came from the individual cells and we can get from a single channel of 10X we can uh, get in the order of 150,000 uh, decent quality transcriptome profiles. So I don't have much time here. And it's, anyway, I wanted to give a computational talk. Uh, so if you're interested in this, there's a very detailed protocol available. And a lot of other labs have already tried and set this up in their own lab. And we've applied this also for kind of arid screens. So if you have a lot of perturbations, you can also use this first uh, round pre-indexing to essentially get barcoding for free um, in, in kind of large-scale single-cell RNA-seq experiments. So essentially, um, that wraps up the story. Uh, I talked in particular in the first two parts about the epigenetic landscape and how we can look into the developmental past and, and uh, flexible future of cells. And it seems that the epigenome is a way by which cells program themselves for future action. And as a computational person, if cells can epigenetically program themselves for future action, that really makes me excited about figuring out whether we could perhaps program cells for future action, whether we can program cells in the same way as we can program computers for doing useful things like uh, G, um, immune therapy, gene therapy, all these type of things. So kind of one major motivation why we've gone into this perturbation screens and causal analysis is really that we want to engineer cells to do those things, to write the epigenetic code of these cells and program them to become therapeutics, to become useful weapons against cancer. So with that, I would like to conclude and thank all the people who have contributed to our work as, as well as, as the funding agencies and of course you for inviting me and for, for your attention. Thank you. We thank you very much, uh, Christoph, uh, and we send you our virtual applause here uh, through, through Zoom. And that was a very exciting talk. Thank you very much. And now we have time for, for questions. Uh, who would like to start? Yeah, so I see a raised hand. Giovanni Visona, one of the ESRs in our network, uh, will ask the first question, please. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you. I find this topic extremely fascinating. So I'm very interested in what you mentioned as a basically as a takeaway for the first part about the capability of trying to program the epigenome of the cells. And I remember seeing recently some work on. Uh, a group that was trying to create basically an epigenomic version of CRISPR. So instead of editing the genome, editing the epigenome. If that were a successful endeavor, what kind of experiments do you think would be most useful? Um, like uh, what kind of experiments would you want to see in the first place? So would you want to try to find um, specific modifications to, uh, I don't know, control, for example, uh, oncogenes or for some other field 
what is the application that you would be most excited for uh, with such an editor? Well? Yes, uh, these technologies for epigenome, crispr based epigenome editing, they are actually quite good already. So uh, they, uh, they do work. Some of them, or most of them, uh, do not provide stable enough information that it does not over erode over a relatively short period of time. But also there, uh, progress is being made by making a lot of combinatorial changes. Uh, and wherever this combination, so uh, we have some projects in the lab where we try to um, use combination of computational and screening technology to really get at this combinatorics of making several epigenetic modifications at once to make them complementary and then more stable over time. Where there is, when I talk with people from the pharmaceutical industry, um, the biggest excitement in epigenome editing is, seems to be with um, altering risk in common complex diseases, because uh, what rare genetic diseases tend to be driven by a single uh, cause a mutation and gene therapy provides us with a good way of handling that. Whereas for complex diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, such as various issues of, of, of the brain, um, the major factor seems to lie in the non-coding space where it's about dosing a gene in just the right way. And if you dose it a bit too much or a bit too little, you might have increased risk for heart attacks or stroke or other, other types of diseases. And targeting um, gene regulatory regions with gene therapy seems complex, perhaps risky, tedious, et cetera. And you would have to make quite a lot of changes to have a, a real impact there. So um, essentially tuning expression of major risk genes um, through epigenome editing. I think this could be very powerful. This is like at least five years off in the future, more like 10 years until this is really hard hitting. But since we as human species have evolved in an environment that is quite different from our current environment, one would think that with the right type of drugs, we could perhaps recalibrate our kind of evolutionary material in a way that we would just make some tweaks here and there, not kind of with the, I'm not talking here in favor of kind of design, CRISPR designer babies or anything in this regard. Uh, this would perhaps already to, be too harsh, but just like modulating a few enhancers here and there in the body to make us cope a bit better with overeating and with sedentary lifestyle and become a bit less fat, stay more sportive and, and live a happier life. I think that's the, the grand vision here. Thank you. It should also be a little bit less controversial than CRISPR because you cannot pass the modifications through the germline or... Uh, yeah, they are possibly reversible. So uh, I would be excited for those applications as well. Thank you. Are there further questions for Christoph? I have one, Christoph. When you, when you presented this fascinating work on the perturbational screening with single cell um, technology and CRISPR, and so on, you described it largely as, as a technology. So, so like how, how far are we in this in this field? So with these different technologies that exist now, can you really um, get a mechanistic model of the full gene regulatory network or how do I have to imagine that? So, this, so the, the state of the art in applying these methods? I think it's clear that adding these perturbational screening data on top of like classical Bayesian network inference of gene regulatory networks adds a huge amount of additional information because uh, it's not purely correlational, but uh, you have some hard perturbations that allow you to validate whether certain pathways are work kind of irrelevant or not. Um, and in a way, we are seeing this with this knowledge prime neural networks, with this concept of deep learning on gene regulatory networks, that this is very powerful, but it still stays correlational and um, um, this is just inferred. And But the moment that we are merging in TROPSIC data, we, uh, we provide kind of selective uh, 
confidence. And this selective confidence can be used with the right mathematical tools to validate the model as, as a whole. So you wouldn't necessarily need to um, knock out or perturb every single knot in your network. And because if you're perturbing just like 10% of the knots or something in that order, uh, every, because everything is connected, it just gives you also quite some validation and confidence for, for the rest of the network. So right now, kind of whether this is already a full mechanistic explanation, probably not, because uh, ultimately um, we are only taking out things here. We would probably also want need to do more gain of function experiments. Uh, I see a lot of power in CRISPR activation screens, um, essentially to get kind of a dose response uh, to upregulate a transcription factor, to downregulate the transcription factor, and then get towards the quantitative metric, because that's something we are notoriously bad, except for perhaps some form of metabolic networks where we have good quantitative data. But in gene regulatory networks, we are so far off in equilibrium that except for a few very focused kind of differential equation models of very specific gene regulatory processes, we do not have a good grasp uh, for like quantitative processes. And I would think that's a, that is a major challenge going forward where these perturbational methods need to be developed further, but also have kind of with the right tweaks will have a lot of potential. Thank you. Yep. Indeed a very fascinating topic. Are there further questions? If not, we also, very close to the end of this this hour. It was a great pleasure listening to you, Christoph. We I truly enjoyed that, and I, I speak here for the whole network. Um, and uh, I thank you again for coming and for now um, taking another half an hour to meet our doctoral students and to talk to to them about career and research. I am sure you have a lot to share. Thanks a lot. That was great. And uh, yeah, enjoy the upcoming half an hour. Thanks again for joining us. And um, Summer School as a whole reconvenes at uh, 3 p.m. Central European time. We continue with Andrea Gama's keynote then. See you in a bit. <laughs>